And, um, you know, Tony, well, I don't know if, what, if you were in high school or pre-high school, you know, he was, he was getting to be a young man. Um, I instantly recognized him when I saw him. I hadn't seen Tony in 45 years, and, and yet uh, it was as if I'd seen him yesterday. Um, I slept over on the couch, I reminded Tony, I slept over on the couch up in the TV room, which they called a couch, but it was really a love seat, <laughs> i.e. small. And um, they would give me a blanket, which I told Tony was, it really wasn't a blanket either, it was a throw, you know, and, and I'd pull it up and my feet would get cold and I'd push it down and my, it was up to about my waist. Tony reminded me it was over the garage, so you can imagine how well insulated the room was. And um, there was no such thing in the house as happy hour. That, there was, that, was, that was a misnomer, hour. It was happy time, you know. Uh, George hated to put a punch in, punch out time on happy time, and uh, it liked to be, you know, let it go al fresco, you know, we'll see what happens. And many nights uh, I'm ready to go to sleep on that couch, and George is still chopping on, and he's got the doors there. And um, I never saw George, never saw George in his cups, if you know what that means. I never saw George. Um, reeling from, from drink. And uh, we always, of course, the guys, when we partied at night at the conventions, and we always, how the hell does he do it, you know? Well, he did confide in me once. Actually, George's right leg was hollow. <laughs> <laughs> and he had a special sphincter that would direct the alcohol into his right leg. And over the course of a day, he would kind of walk it off, you know? Um, so he, he had amazing capacity, and um, our travels together, uh, he took me to some of the garden spots of America. <laughs> One of which close by here, uh, Alex and uh, Joel, uh, Cambridge Springs, have you ever been there? Even, you have been there? Okay. Uh, that was like a blip on the screen, uh, Cambridge Springs. Had a school there called Alliance College an interesting school because it was supported by the Polish National Alliance for basically is a school for people of Polish backgrounds who wanted to continue and, uh, and be with that kind of an environment. Nice bunch of guys we had there. Um, but that school closed, unfortunately. It became a Bible college or something. And then uh, George took me to Las Vegas. Las Vegas, New Mexico. Um, that was uh, New Mexico Highlands University, I'm sure you've all heard of that, which I also think is a Bible college right now. Um, and of course we went to Holton, Maine. I don't know if anyone's been that far north. You have to have a passport uh, to get there. Uh, that's it's, it's, it's next to frozen tundra. Uh, it's, it's about like the Arctic Circle almost up there. In the summer, there's snow up to your butt, you know what I mean? It's, it's a great spot. Anyway, uh, Ricker College, and I'm sure you've all heard of that. Um, that school is a Bible college now also. <laughs> um, we had some good luck and some awful bad luck. <laughs> But we had fun, and we spread the name of Pauline to Defy. And um, I'm not getting into the Virginia situation because that's dear to my heart, but that's just one example of Pauline to Defy and what we've done, what we've accomplished, uh, and make our founders proud. And I'm proud to have been part of it. I'm proud to have been part of it with George. Uh, we had a special friendship a special relationship. I called them pops, uh, which I told Tony uh, that I'd seen he called them pops too. I called them pops and of course whenever we got in the car we'd go about 12 miles and he'd say, are we there yet? <laughs> that was a kind of a thing between us. I'm going to go over to the, um, to our memorial board, the George, our newest member. And I want to underline what Stan said. This is, you don't have to just pass to get on here, okay? That's chapter eternal. You pass, and everybody who 
My limb passes gets on that. This is a special bunch of men. You know, it, it almost looks like this is the foundation, and it is. This is the foundation of Pilem Defy. These men built the foundation and built the fraternity. Our three founders, Fisher, Levy, and Werner. Herb Kaus, first Catholic president of Pilem Defy. Ten years president. Amazing man, died young. Very little known by our people today, and probably most all of you here. Jerome Alexander, excuse me, Jerome Melnicka, one of the five Melnickers from um, New York Delta Cornell. Five Highland brothers. Arthur Garfield Hayes. Civil Rights, Supreme Rights of the Fraternity, <coughs> and that time a, a, an honorary position rather than necessarily a working position. Walter Blankford, another fellow, I think he was president of Supreme Rights for about 10 years. Jerome Alexander, back to the very beginning, of Pilot number five. Edward Orloff, whose son now is a member of uh, our foundation. Jack Bukai, executive director of Pilot the Phi, died in the service of the fraternity, uh, coming back from installation of uh, Beta Sigma Tau chapters, I believe. <coughs> uh, two planes collided over Staten Island, one went down Staten Island, one in Brooklyn. Jack unfortunately lost his life in that. Louis P. Myers, Oklahoma. Izzy Halpern, again, a foundation of Pilot and Defy. Julian Silverman, Pitt alum, chapter supervisor, long time. When I first started, I, he, was the, he was the man to go to. Gersten Allen from Toronto, Bennett Surf from Columbia, Martha Fuldauer, not a brother, but very important to the foundation of our fraternity. Sidney Ween, died as president of fraternity, um, member Munchak. Oscar Gottfried, long time serving pilot from the earliest days. Bill Melnicker, Snap Melnicker. Some of you know him, some of you know him. If there ever was a Mr. Pilot, it was Snap. Roger Kaufman. Late 30s graduate of Yale, again, a yeoman service to this attorney. Leo Weinrod, Judge Leo Weinrod from Philadelphia, uh, helped finally get my chapter um, installed at Lafayette when the Board of Trustees didn't want a fraternity that accepted by Nari. Dorothy Beck, Ed Goldman, Paul Marks from Florida, Norman Silverman, Stevens, President of the Attorney, Fred Dobbins, Vice President, Merv Sluzer, um, Beta Sigma Rho Pi Lam, who made a seamless transition to Pi Lam Defy from Beta Sigma Rho, longtime advisor Penn, Jules Leonard, again another Mr. Pi Lam, Dick Hine, <coughs> Stan Glasser, and now George Beck. Um, just one other addendum I'd like to make. Uh, David's brother, David Temple's brother, Riley, joined my chapter and became Rex. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to invite uh, to represent the professional staff of the attorney, Ian Lowe, our executive director. Ian? George Beck, a legend, a person who has inspired so many. How do you describe his impact? 
I don't think words do justice. But when asked to think about how he has impacted me as a current member of our professional staff and those who serve on our staff currently, as I reflected on that question, there were four words that came to my mind. And of course, there's so many more, but there were four that really stuck out about George. The first was dedication. And whether it was the tremendous dedication that he showed to his family, it was the dedication that he showed our professional staff over a quarter century of working for it, his tremendous dedication to the military, or dedication in the sense of just a love, a love for our organization, its history, its values, his dedication was unquestionable. Tenacity was the second word. Again, whether it was his tremendous military accomplishments or it was what he did at the University of Virginia to fight for what was right, having um, the first fraternity there to be inclusive. Or maybe it was simply navigating through the ups and downs that come with being in the fraternal movement over a quarter century. Or maybe it was having to make not always popular decisions, but the right decisions to lead our organization. He was certainly tenacious. Spirit is the third word. And I say spirit because, gosh, I loved his smile. Every time I saw him, always a smile. He had this spirit about him. He was always positive, always happy. That spirit, whether it was his smile or the way in which he connected with any Pylan member, old or young, he, he had those pieces that enabled him to be compassionate, loved, and just such a role model uh, for, for people. So I define that as spirit. And then the final word is humility. I knew George as a legend when I first joined. He was already considered a legend in Pi Lambda Phi. But in all of my conversations with George, it was never he who spoke of his accomplishments. And he certainly could have, but it was never himself. It was everyone else that shared of his tremendous accomplishments personally and professionally. It is those four words, dedication, tenacity, spirit, and humility that I think of when I think of George. His passing leaves a void that cannot be filled. Yet, his immeasurable influence, immeasurable influence, serves as such a model for the men and the members of our professional staff as we try to serve and advance this fraternity to make it better than it was. We are so very thankful for the way in which George has role modeled. Thank you, George. Thanks, Ian. <clears throat> now, representing the uh, University of Pittsburgh alumni, I'd like to invite holder of the big pie, Joel Smalley, to uh, speak to us. Joel? You know, despite what Andy said about the hard times when he started working for Pi Lambda Phi, at least in those days they could afford an office in Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> it's a privilege to speak at a tribute for, to George Beck. I know when he was active, I knew him when he was active uh, in traveling uh, through the fraternity system and when he was inactive in his retirement because he lived in western Pennsylvania. I last saw George at uh, the 100th anniversary celebration of uh, uh, our chapter Gamma Sigma at the University of Pittsburgh. We started in 1914 and in October we had our 100th anniversary celebration. That event speaks volumes about we and I were so committed to fraternities. We both felt that fraternities had a 
serious impact on young men's lives. And that 100th anniversary dramatized that impact because you had guys coming back to uh, Pitt who had graduated 20, 30, 40, even 50 years ago. And the relationships that they formed as a result of the fraternity had been maintained over all those years. So that's why George and I were committed to the system. He, was, he and I were both committed to Pi Lam Phi specifically, but the system is so import, was so important to both of us. And we discussed that at the time, and uh, uh, it, the 100th anniversary with all these guys coming back after all those years just reminded us of how important the relationships that had been for, formed at the time of their undergraduate time and later meant to these guys. Many of... Uh, uh, Many undergraduates look at IHQ as a vacuum that sucks up their dues and doesn't give them anything in return. I can speak about a, a current incident at the University of Pittsburgh uh, where the uh, IHQ committed sub significant uh, resources uh, to that incident and the, re and the positive resolution of that incident. So on behalf of the University of Pittsburgh chapter, I'd like to publicly thank IHQ for their support at that time. George was blessed with a long life, and Pi Lambda Phi was blessed with George. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. If there are any friends and neighbors who would like to say anything, you're welcome to come up at this time. Anyone? Okay. Um, now, I know Tony Beck is going to speak for, to, for the family, but if there are any family members who would like to come up, uh, feel free. Anybody want to say anything? If not, Tony, please. You know, we all have stories about my dad. And I learned yesterday, for instance, Danny's story about calling him Pops. And I remember when I was in college, I didn't want anybody to know that uh, my father was the executive secretary when I was at Roanoke College. So I called him GB at the time, so no one would know he was my dad. And uh, that kind of evolved into Pops. And it's nice to hear, at least last night, for the first time I heard that Andy called him the same thing. But he, he'll always be dad to me, but it's lovely when I get together with members of the fraternity and his brothers, and I hear all these wonderful stories about how he shared himself with others. Um, most of you at least got to meet my dad when you were either in college or shortly after college. I met him a little earlier. <laughs> and it, it's been a long and wonderful life. And before I go any further, I want to thank all of you for coming today. Um, some of you traveled long distances. For me, it was a pleasure to come here and to meet a lot of the people I hadn't met before. But I'd like to make uh, a particular thanks, if I could, to the executive council members who are here, the educational foundation members, Laura Patricio for, on behalf of the headquarters administration, current and past presidents who are here, who are represented by Jeff Bueller, past and succeeding executive directors, represented by Ian Lowe, brothers in attendance, uh, especially to those who uh, participated and took the time to make the wonderful photo display and the arrangements for this celebration of my dad's life, as well as Barry and her family. I wrote some things down, but um, I think a better representation of who my dad was is in the photos you've all seen. I was going to talk about some other things, but I s was struck by the pictures I saw of my dad with various members of the fraternity and the people that surrounded him during his life. And there were a couple of constants in there. Um, if you looked at those photos, 
in the display, in every picture there was my dad with the fraternity emblem, fraternity hat, fraternity brothers surrounded by brothers and people who meant the most in the world to him. He was happiest when he was with the members of his fraternity, and he was happiest when he was serving his fraternity. And there were a couple of constants, and I think you saw him in those pictures, and I think many of you have mentioned that, his unwavering smile. There was, I don't, I think there might have been one or two pictures, and they were at conventions when he was serious, but in almost every picture, he's smiling. And he was smiling because he was with his fraternity brothers. And those are the constants that you see in all those pictures. His dedication and his happiness being with the brothers of the fraternity. There were a couple of other constants too, and usually if you looked in one of those pictures, there was rarely a picture where there didn't involve a glass of some <laughs> sort. And I can assure you it wasn't water, iced tea. In fact, there was a picture of my sister. She had two iced teas in front of her. <laughs> George had a glass of doers. There was little in his life that didn't revolve around doers. And I think it was, a, it was a habit he picked up in college and it never left. And if anything about my dad was true, he was constant. He was the, the picture of unwavering consistency. He was consistent in his, in his devotion to the fraternity. He was consistent in his devotion to his family, and he was consistent in his devotion to Scotch. From the time he was in UVA, he forged friendships with his brothers back in the 40s before he went off to serve in the war as part of America's greatest generation. Later he returned to work for the fraternity and it was at a time when there were a lot of problems with fraternities. Uh, many of you have already spoken about the divisiveness that was going on in the United States, the fact that at least at that time for me in the late 60s fraternities weren't always looked upon as such a great institution in America. They were looked on kind of in a sideways fashion. And it was a time of great change, both for our country and for the universities where we all went to school. I went to Roanoke, Virginia Lambda Kappa, and it was a school in Virginia that was experiencing some of the same changes that you guys have discussed in, in, that was going on. There were racial issues, there was a war that was going on that was very, very unpopular, and there were people who were changing day to day. And even though we refer to a my dad's generation is America's greatest generation. I think it's my generation, a lot of us, who made some of the greatest changes in terms of bringing America into the modern, modern nation it really is. But when my father worked for the fraternity and went back to work for the fraternity, it wasn't an easy time. It, there was a time he had to organize the business of the fraternity. There were a lot of chapters. There was a lot of money that was being spent. It was a business he had to organize, which he did so well. And it was a time, as you've heard, that some of the chapters were having a lot of problems. And he made every effort and every chance he got to expand the fraternity, to make it better, to make it bigger, to make it more organized. And he was always aware that this was a business. And in order to run a business, it had to be organized. And he did that with his own personal touch. I can remember him traveling a lot when I was growing up. He always visited the chapters, but it wasn't as if he was visiting the chapters just because he had to make a stop because it was March 19th and he had to be at the University of Virginia or another university. He loved traveling with the fraternity. He got to know the deans of the colleges, something I don't think a lot of the, his colleagues had done. He personally knew the deans at all the schools where there were chapters. He conferred with his counterparts at other fraternities. They mentioned Howard Alter, and he knew them personally. And most of all, he got to know the Brothers of the Pledges at each of the chapters. He mentored the chapter officers, he mentored those around him, and he taught his colleagues the business of running a fraternity and to making it a successful, and in that way, a long-term business. And I'm not saying it because it was a successful business, but it was the key, at least as I could see, to making sure that Pi Lambda Phi weathered the tough times and succeeded in the good. Year in and year out, he was committed to the success of the fraternity, and as you can see from the pictures that we've all been looking at, he was happiest when he was in the company of his fraternity brothers. The fraternity was his life. He embedded 
the spirit of Pilam, I'm sorry, he embodied the spirit of Pilam because for him it was not four years and it was his lifetime. Thank you all for your memories and I hope to share some other stories with you along the way. Okay, one quick note, as I uh, yesterday received a call from uh, Laura in our office who uh, leave it to a woman to remind somebody, did you order flowers? And of course, no. So uh, she placed a call to uh, Alex Dannenberg, who was a fraternity brother here in Pittsburgh, and I'd like to thank Alex for the floor arrangements today. Um, what we thought would be nice, um, as you know, anyone who serves our country in uniform uh, when they pass uh, is entitled to military honors. So at George's service in Florida, uh, there was an honor guard who provided that, and we thought it would be nice to share that for anyone who didn't see it. So we're going to have that show that service uh, now, and uh, since it's a replay, you can remain uh, seated as there's a point where they ask everyone to stand. So please uh, remain seated, and we'd like to share that with you now. Thank you. 